Good afternoon, everyone. Good to have you here. Yeah, I appreciate Rick giving the, uh, the invitation. What has been on the website now for three weeks or a month? Um, this is what Rick wrote. I needed to know what my assignment was. Give it specific. So Rick writes, why are Pepperdine presidents so deeply connected to Churches of Christ? Is it simply a matter of university policy? Let me stop there and say yes. Uh, we have a foundational document, the bylaws of Pepperdine University. I think it's about 15 pages. It's not hidden. There's copies all over the campus. And uh, it clearly states that the president of Pepperdine needs to be a member of the Church of Christ. I think the language is in good standing, which means someone who actually attends and go, has a prayer life and goes to church and gets involved. And um, all eight presidents have fit that definition. George Pepperdine chose the first three presidents. And president number five, Howard White, he knew very well. So four of our eight have known the founder. And uh, that's been important in our beginning. And um, we have an executive, the board is 40 members, the board of trustees. We have an executive committee that carries most of the work, 11 members. And the bylaws state that a majority of those 11, it's usually six, have to be members of the Church of Christ. So the executive committee has a majority. Uh, there has to be a majority in the 40 member board. And then there's the Religious Standards Committee. That's nine people. All nine of those are members of the Church of Christ. If the question comes up revolving around the religion department or the whole issue of religion in the campus, that board deals with that. And every member of the Church of Christ on the board is welcome to join that meeting, and they often do. So there's the bylaw. So the first part, is it simply a matter of university policy? It is, it is a matter of university policy. But, as Rick says, or is there a vital purpose to this relationship that gives life and meaning to the Pepperdine mission? And the answer is yes, and I'm going to show you that now. And he says, we're going to explore, I love to explore. We're going to explore roots. I especially like to explore roots. And we're going to, the roots of the Pepperdine story, and I love the Pepperdine story. I've never been given this assignment before to do it through the eyes of the presidents. Let me say right here, we do this kind of thing a lot. The next time we have a history moment, I'm going to suggest that the lecture be on the eight first ladies, who are remarkable women. I've gotten to know that better in the last two weeks. And we add to that Mary Pepperdine, his mother, and Helen Pepperdine, his second wife, after his first wife died, the woman who shared his dream of starting a college. Those ten women would make a great presentation. That's not what I'm doing today. But I would be happy to help with that after doing this research. Okay, before we can go to Los Angeles, there are two roots you've got to know. There are two things that define us. Number one is Alexander Campbell, the starting of Bethany College. Bethany College becomes the alma mater for all of the colleges. The, uh, the school begins in 1840. Uh, first students arrive in 41, but all the documentation is 1840. And in the last 180 years, over 500 colleges have been established that go back to Campbell's Bethany College. Bethany is still there. And... Um, Bethany really has been an alma mater to our movement. And the famous quote from Campbell, colleges are, in every point of view, the most important and useful institutions on earth, second only to the Church of Christ in their inherent claims upon Christian liberality and Christian patronage. When you have a movement like ours that really emphasizes the life of the mind, loving God with all your mind, you're, you're going to have a lot of colleges. That's what we're about. We have started so many. When I did my research on Oregon, we started nine schools before the turn of the century. In California, we started six before the turn of the century. We, you know, if, when you move to a place and there's 20 people there, this time I'm going back to like 1870, what are they going to do with 20 members of the church? They're going to start a gospel paper and they're going to start a school. <laughs> that happens in community after community. It's who we are. Uh, I, I agree that to be perfect, you love God, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
we have not been accused of overdoing heart and emotion. We have been accused of overdoing mind and rationality. This hunger for the search of truth. So we start with Campbell. Who understands this? When Norval Young is writing his PhD dissertation for George Peabody in the mid-1940s, he understands this. And he ends his book, he later publishes it, he ends this book with the phrase, from Bethany to Pepperdine. I couldn't believe it the first time I saw it. I mean, it was absolutely correct. From Bethany to Pepperdine, each of these colleges has been marked by a definite independence from any church organization. While these schools were controlled indirectly by the faith and patronage of the membership of the Churches of Christ, this control was never through any organic connection between the church and the colleges. Norville's book, published in 1949. So here we are, from Bethany to Pepperdine. The first college, 1840 to Pepperdine, over 500 colleges. So the first route is up in the little panhandle of West Virginia, uh, you've got the west coast of Pennsylvania, the east coast of Ohio. It's about a 30-minute, 40-minute drive from Pittsburgh Airport over to Little Bethany, and that's where our first route is. Route number two is Kansas, of course, and that means the route is down here in Labette County, right by the Oklahoma line, right by the Missouri line. The only town of, I mean, the only uh, city of any size there is Parsons, and this is where John and Mary Pepperdine decide to move. They come by covered wagon in 1883. He came out the year before to find a farm. He found 80 acres, 10 miles below uh, Mountain, uh, Mound Valley. I would like to say I've tromped all over that property. I have not, but David Baird has, so I pump him for questions. A lot of streams and rivers there for baptism. You know. When they come, they have no religious connection. But very soon after they come, either later that year in 1883 or in 1884 at the latest, and they already have one child. Fred has already been born, but George hasn't been born yet. The Church of Christ in Parsons uh, organizes a tent meeting. And I don't know who the traveling evangelist was. They were all good. And a traveling evangelist came, and he preached this restoration of New Testament Christianity. Um, this... this this motto of in matters of faith, unity. In matters of opinion, liberty. In all things, love. Christians only, but not the only Christians. This movement to call all Christians, to wear the name of Christ, call Christ church, Christ church, go back to the Bible, see it as authoritative, more than that, even as trustworthy. And here is this preacher preaching these simple precepts and they thought they were going out to meet their neighbors and to just have a social time. But they were caught up in this and they were baptized into Christ in one of those tributaries running south of Parsons. And George Pepperdine is raised in this family. He is steeped in this family. They have uh, the oldest boy, Fred. George comes along here in, uh, sorry, in uh, 1886. And then his younger brother is Ben. And they grow up in that little one-room house where he's born. Uh, they build on a couple of rooms. But eventually, they move to the Woods Place. Do you know the uh, painting, American Gothic? This looks like him. You know, uh, uh, John Pepperdine is not holding a pitchfork here. He's just holding his straw hat in his hand here. But Mary's got her watering can, and she is willing to stop for just a moment and take this picture. But she wants to get back to watering all of her plants. This is four miles west of Mound Valley. So we're about 14 miles from Parsons. And this is where they build that great barn in the back that's the envy of the whole county. And George says that he and Ben play out there all the time. This is where they go to all the gospel meetings. And George says he grew up wanting to be a gospel preacher. Of course. I mean, we're, how many role models do you have? That was his role model. But he discovered pretty early he was not a good public speaker. God had other things in mind for George. But this was his home. So we have two roots here now. Alexander Campbell, Bethany College, George Pepperdine growing up here. And those two roots are going to define what happens here in Los Angeles. So George at 21, 1905, marries Lena Baker. They go to Kansas City. I'm not going to tell you that story. We know that story. He founds Western Auto. Great story. You've heard it. I want to go up here at 38, 1924. And on November 6th of 23, he has just opened the largest 
auto supply store on planet Earth, four stories high, down at the corner of 11th and Grand. And uh, what a night that was. And now as you come to the mid-1920s to the late 1920s, how do we define when does George Pepperdine get the idea what I should do with my fortune is build a college? The, the next slide is my guess. I'm not sure David agrees with me, and he's a better historian. Uh, but my guess is that when he took his mother around the world for four months, they left Parsons on February 19, and they got back into the Midwest on June 23, for four months in the, in the spring and summer of 1928, George Pepperdine takes his mother around the world. By the way, if you come out here and go down to the Heritage Center right down at the end of this room, you see this painting that I've got hanging on the wall. Here's George Pepperdine with his mother taking her around the world. Three weeks before this photo was made, their ship came in at Hong Kong, and the missionaries came to meet them, and one was George Benson. And I, there's no way I can overestimate what that meant to Pepperdine. He really wanted Benson to be his first president, and they remained close for the rest of their lives. And I'm glad I, I got to speak at Harding while Benson was still living, and he told me some Pepperdine stories, and I feel like I know this story pretty well. Benson died in 1991. But... Uh, he comes on board, and the two of them meet on April 24, 1928. Three weeks later, Campbell is staying here at the home of Brother Rhodes, uh, E.A. Rhodes. This is his house. This is Rhodes. But here he is with, uh, here's Harry Robert Fox. He's a graduate of Lipscomb. This does not escape George Pepperdine. Here is O.D. Bixler. He's a graduate of Cordell Christian College. This does not escape George Pepperdine. Here is McCaleb himself, John Moody McCaleb, J. M. McCaleb, who came in 1892. He studied under J. W. McGarvey at the College of the Bible in Lexington, Kentucky. This does not escape George Pepperdine. And uh, sitting on his lap here is Ramona Fox. This is her father. And Ramona, they're all going to go to Pepperdine, all these Fox kids. In fact, Harry Robert is going to, you know, Lipscomb's only a junior college. When George starts the school, they got to finish school somewhere. The joke, of course, is that Harry Robert Fox, with eight children, is taking a course in love, courtship, and marriage from Norval Young, who was a bachelor. <laughs> I would love to sit in on some of those. I wonder if Harry Robert raised his hand ever to say any questions to Norval. But here's Ramona, and she goes to Pepperdine, and she meets a boy, and they fall in love. That's Kenny Hahn, and so we have the Hahn fireside room here at Pepperdine. I think it's true that Pepperdine gave money to Kenny's uh, campaign, but I think it's true that he let the students out one day to go door to door and campaign for Kenny. Kenny wins the supervisor's seat and serves 40 years. And his daughter is now sitting in his chair. I mean, Janice is now one of the five supervisors running this county. And, of course, the son was our mayor, you know, for a while, Jimmy Hahn. So this particular picture with all these people who've been in college, I think this is where George begins to think, what do I do with my fortune and the possibility of a college? Then he marries Helen. His first wife dies in January 1930. He's, uh, he's completely alone for two years. He meets her at church in 32. Uh, they're married on June 17, 34. That's three days before his 48th birthday. I think they met when she was 32 and they, she was 34 when they married. He starts a second family. He had two daughters by his first family. But she is very much in favor of the college idea. And I don't know if she goes with him to Nashville. And I don't know if he goes by train or if they drive. I know that he writes ahead to Sam Hall, and Sam says, I will introduce you to A.M. Burton. That's who Pepperdine wants to meet, wealthiest man in, in, uh, in Nashville, and has the tallest building in downtown life and casualty. And Pepperdine meets with him, and Burton says, I'm keeping Lipscomb going here. You go back to Los Angeles and build a college. We need a Christian college. You can't underestimate what Burton is doing. But who pick, if he goes by train, I saw an account, who picks him up at the airport? Matt Young, the father of Norval Young. And so whether it's Matt Young or Sam Hall, there are different people that are making sure Pepperdine meets A. M. Burton, and he gets this challenge. But having said all of that, in the end, I think all historians agree, the person who makes the difference is Hugh Tyner. And the person who has the most influence 
Tyner uh, graduates from Abilene Christian. He goes to Stanford and get a master's. He comes back here, becomes superintendent of schools in Los Angeles. He's still in his 20s. And he's preaching for the Sitchell Street Church of Christ. And he's got a one-hour program, radio program, uh, on KF, uh, v D, KFVD radio station in Los Angeles. And it's one hour. I guess it was probably 15 minutes. I was thinking what I could do if I was doing a radio show. Yeah, let's go with 15. 30 it's tops. He does this for 20 years. After he's president. He starts in 1930 and goes to 1950, a one-hour show every Sunday morning. He's got singing groups. He's got quartets. He gives the news of what's happening in the Churches of Christ. The children's home over here in Ontario have just welcomed 10 more orphans this week. And a big truck rolled up this week with food from the San Joaquin Valley. That's the kind of stuff he's giving on the radio. He's uniting the churches of Christ. But he's got a Bible lesson. He's teaching. And the, class, and the program is called Take Time to Be Holy, based on the great hymn. So George Pepperdine is touched by this, calls him to a meeting. They meet for the first time. David and I can't nail down the date. Could have been as early as 33 before he married Helen. It wasn't any later than 35. Somewhere right in there, he, they meet. And that's where your history and my history is where we're all touched by that meeting. I'd love to have a, somebody had a recording of that meeting because George says, um, you grew up in Texas and you went to Stanford? And, yeah. But now you're preaching for the Central Street, yeah. And you've got this radio program for an hour every week. How have you remained faithful to come out of the Bible Belt and come here to California? How have you remained faithful? And Tyner said, well, I went to Abilene Christian College. More than that, I needed a place to stay, and I boarded with uh, the president, Betzel and Faye Baxter. You ought to meet them. Wonderful. I think that's really probably the turning point there. And so uh, I found the letter this week where George Benson writes, I think it's January 6, 1937, I know you wanted me to be your president, but I can't leave Harding. They brought me back last year, and of course he stays 29 years as president. But the man you want is Baxter. So you got you got uh, Benson himself saying you want Baxter, and you got Tyner saying you want Baxter. So George says, "Get Baxter out here," and that's where the history begins with Howard White, February, 1937, where Tyner says we stayed up way too long, way into the dark of the night, and finally George said that night, "All my questions have been answered. We are going to start the school in September." To which Tyner gave the famous reply. This September? <laughs> Seven months away. We don't even have a campus. Seven months away. But that was the night. Tyner, Baxter, and Pepperdine. So right after that comes the letter. And um, the first letter that ever went out to all the members of the church cried, who sent this to me? Lola Tyner, after I moved here, she thought, Jerry's sort of a historian. He needs to know this. Jerry. This is a copy of the very first letter Hugh Tyner and George Pepperdine sent out in 1937 about the possibility and all of that. Well, what does he say? I mean, he gets right to it. March 15, 1937. To Christian parents and friends in California, would you like to see a college started in Southern California similar to Harding or David Lipscomb or Abilene Christian College? Boy, he didn't waste any. How are you doing? Are you having a good day? He says, would you like to see that? And, and the response, according to Lola, she said, the response was so overwhelming. George knew he was going to start the school. So we come to dedication. George is being welcomed here by uh, uh, Governor Miriam, Frank Miriam, the governor of the state. And he's giving this great speech, his dedication speech. He's 51 years old at this point, And now the handshake, he's welcoming up to the mic, Basil Baxter. They're born in the same year, but Baxter's birthday is November. He's only 50. He looks older. Baxter always seemed older, people who tell me. Um, whereas Tyner is only 29 in this picture, and he looks older. And uh, he's, you know, he's going to be the first team. But here is... Pepperdine, introducing Basil Baxter, who will be President 1, and the Dean Hugh Tyner, who will be President 2. And they buy a church, it was actually St. Michael's Catholic Church over in Manchester, and they cut it in two, and they put it on a couple long bits, and they hauled it down Vermont Avenue, put it back together, put a new steeple on it, painted it. 
I love this picture, I confess, because I love this lamp pole. This is great. And the palm tree, and then the Christmas tree. Wow, this is black and white perfection here. This did not get here, though, till 39. Tyner was the preacher for, for Vermont Avenue Church guys for the first two years of the school, and they met right across the street at the Masonic Hall. And then they finally move into this in 39. But when they move in here, now Tyner is president, because Baxter only serves two years. And so somebody else becomes the minister of the church. So here they all are. The first six were all full-time preachers getting a salary, being paid by a church of Christ before they became Pepperdine presidents. That'll be on the final in a moment. <laughs> first six were all full-time, were preaching. Uh, Baxter starts out, um, he's preaching at Corsicana, Hugh Tyner, Sitchell Street, Vermont Avenue, Hugh ends up the last 10 years of his life preaching for Uptown in Long Beach. Uh, Norval preaches for the Broadway Church in Lubbock. Bill preaches for the Broadway Church in Lubbock and some other churches. Howard preaches 12 years for Carrollton Avenue in New Orleans and builds that beautiful building. Just like Norval's building Broadway, Howard is over in New Orleans building Carrollton Avenue. David preaches for the El Cajon Boulevard Church in San Diego when their minister goes on sabbatical. And now the last two have not preached uh, and been paid for it. Andy preaches a lot and preaches well. James is a great speaker, or Jim. But both of them immediately worked for Christian colleges. As soon as Andy graduated, he became, in effect, the assistant to Terry uh, Johnson. Johnson, you know, at Oklahoma Christian. And uh, so by the time he comes here, he has a lot of years of experience. Uh, Jim goes to Abilene Christian. He, gra he comes here to law school, graduates first in the class, has a practice for about six years, comes back in 1999, and he works 20 years here. So every single one of the eight presidents have been involved in either preaching or working for Christian schools, and that's one of the things that unites them, and I'll say a word about, about each of them. Basil Baxter, what's the one thing I would say about him? He's president of Abilene Christian from 18, uh, 1924 to 1932, right after the Depression starts. They move the campus, he moves the campus from over there on South First, over there by the Coca-Cola factory, moves it all the way up to what, when I was in school, we called Holy Hill, moves it up to Holy Hill in 1929 and builds the first seven buildings. And here it is. And we're going up Washington. Here's Washington. I lived right here one time. I lived over here across from Sewell Auditorium. Behind this is the University Church Christ. I lived it with J.D. Thomas right about there. And I live with Brother Brown over in his apartments there. You move around a lot at Abilene. You know? <laughs> Here you come up to Washington. This is McDonald's Hall, the girls' dorm, Sewell Auditorium, administration building going up. It, it had, you know, additions on either side. He builds the first seven. This is our first president at Pepperdine. When he leaves here, he goes to Lipscomb to be president. Pepperdine is his third school to be president. <laughs> so he's the ideal person to get us accredited. And he does in seven months. Now, the graphic says that was some kind of record and no school had ever done. I'm not sure that's right. Maybe. Sounds good. It looked good in the graphic. Nobody's ever gotten accredited in seven months before. We did. And that was attributed to uh, Baxter. Then we go to Tyner. Uh, Abilene, you know, he's baptized into... Every one of these were baptized into Christ when they were teenagers. And... Uh, he comes to Stanford, then he go. He becomes the preacher at Sitchell and Altura Street uh, uh, for about five years, and then he's the preacher at Vermont Avenue, and then he ends his career uh, over here at uh, Uptown in Long Beach, preaches the last 10 years of his life. So when he dies on January 6, 1981, the funeral's on January 10, who would come and speak at that? Well, Norval Young and Howard White. And uh, Hubert Derrick, his best friend, I was the original member of the faculty, and the preacher at this time, Stuart Love. Stuart and Desta were in a ministry there, serving us here at Pepperdine. That's pretty typical. Two of the presidents died on this campus, and they wanted their funerals here. Howard's funeral was in uh, uh, the chapel, Stauffer Chapel, and that was, he died on February 1 of 1991, and the funeral was February 7. Norval Young died on uh, February 18, his funeral was in uh, the field house on February 20, 1,500 people, great events. On, and here's Hugh Tyner, you know, the, everybody at his funeral are, are from uh, Pepperdine. 
Now, during Tyner's reign, what takes place? The beginning of the Bible lectures, January 1943, they're still going. The beginning of the master's program in religion, that's still going. Now we've added the MDiv. Who are the teachers? Basil Barrett Baxter, who starts the graduate. William Green, we have a lecture program named for William Green. He was at Berkeley, but he came down to help. And, and the uh, W.B. West, who was the, uh, the head of the department and so on. First, uh, key, uh, uh, Thompson is in line one, Otis Gatewood is number two. Here's the Bible lectures two years later. It's getting bigger. It started out in the library, moves to the auditorium. Here's Arian Hogan, the great black evangelist at Figueroa. Now one of our deans is preaching in his footsteps, David Holmes. And uh, behind him is Otis Gatewood. And when he gets this master's, he's already made plans. He's going to, as soon as they defeat Hitler, he's going to Germany. And he writes a book called Preaching in the Footsteps of Hitler. And it's hard to put down. And all the churches, he and all the others, he persuaded to go. Why do we have an off-campus program in Heidelberg? That wasn't an idle guess. We had a Church of Christ there. And it was strong. And they had a Bible school. And they could help us get our feet on the ground. We didn't just flip a coin and say, well, we're going to start an international program. Where should we start? No, the question was, where do we have friends? We have friends in the Church of Christ. Where are we strong? We're pretty strong in Heidelberg. We got a Bible school going there. Let's go take a look at Heidelberg. Yeah, this is lovely. I think our students would like this. Yeah, they do. So here's uh, in this front row. Here's uh, here's the dean, Coyus, George Pepperdine, Hugh Tyner, W. B. West, Basil Barrett. Here is J. M. McCaleb. Pepperdine has brought him back after Pearl Harbor. He knows his life is in danger. I'll give you a job. He comes back and teaches Bible. And when he dies, he's buried in Eaglewood Cemetery, not far from George and Helen Pepperdine. He and his wife are there. And over, um, this is um, G.W. Riggs. He's the, pre the founder of Sitchell Street. And this is Jimmy Lovell, the editor of the California Christian. And then the, he brings out uh, Marshall Keeble. And here's Tyner introducing Marshall Keeble to a, a group of area preachers. And Keeble becomes a fixture at Pepperdine in the late 40s and on into the 50s. Now to Norval Young, who builds this. Norval and Helen take a trip to Europe in 1949 to look at cathedrals and church buildings. Because they, they want Churches of Christ to build something nicer than we've been building. We're always tiny little buildings. And they come back and build this, and it opens in 1950. There's no way to underestimate the impact of this building going up in 1950. Just look at the Van Nuys building in 52. Look at everything that went up right after this. We learned that it was okay, okay to build something this big. And uh, so Norval comes from there, and he has a close relationship with George Pepperdine. And, uh, and he builds the lectureship. The lectureship had really dwindled in, from uh, about 51 on. Frank Pack went to Abilene, Baxter, Baxter went back to Lipscomb, W.B. West went to Harding and started the graduate school. From 51 to 56, getting smaller. 57, the only year we had no Bible lectures. Norval comes, 58, he brings his best buddy, Batsel Barrett Baxter, one of the best known people in the church, good crowd. 59, bigger. 60, a little bigger. 61, Shrine Auditorium. And uh, March 23rd, closing night. I couldn't get in the chandelier, it's right up here. You know? But this is where the, uh, the Oscars were taking place. And uh, who was singing up on the stage that night? The Abilene Christian College a cappella chorus? The Pepperdine a cappella chorus. And who was up here leading singing? 6,000 people there. Pat Boone, of course. You just walked through the Pat Boone you know, a sign out there. And the next year, bigger yet, this was March 23, one year later, March 22, 62, they had to go to the LA Sports Arena, attendance between 8,000 and 11,000. George Pepperdine wheeled in on a gurney, came all the way up to here. William Teague, vice president, handed him a microphone, and Pepperdine speaks for the last time four months before his death. I have interviewed people in six or eight western states. Were you there that night? Yeah, what do you remember, he said. And I've gradually come to realize that that phrase about the hand of God that he uses in the opening address, he used again this night, mm -hmm. if we are guided by the hand of God. But he told them how happy he was with this school. And it was all that he wanted it to be. It was a great night. Again, Abilene Christian Chorus, Pepperdine Chorus, Pat Boone leading, singing again. And then the international program. Howard White just wouldn't let up about, we got to do this. Heidelberg would be good. Norville agreed with him. 
And finally, they got it done in September 63. The first faculty member, Howard White, teacher of history. And off they go, 38 <coughs> students, I think. Then we buy Morehouse in um, 65. The man who does all that is J.C. Moore. Uh, is he our control, controller? Or, he, uh, outstanding leader in Churches of Christ. When he dies in 69 at a very young age, they decide to name the house for him because he found it. He did all the work, you know, arranging for us to get it. I mean, this is where Eisenhower and his his forces met on their way to Berlin to end World War II. I mean, they, they're getting close. They're about to defeat Hitler, and they come into this house. And this is full of history, and this is our home and the first of the international program. But now he becomes president in 71. His job is to develop this new campus, 138 acres. And he begins, you know, he puts up that theme tower in the chapel. The theme tower, he insisted he wanted that cross, and it is beautiful, 125 feet. The chapel also has a cross. But when Bill was laying out this, and he and Norval were dreaming about scriptures and so on, Bill wanted that open Bible right there. And every time I go in and sit in there, I see Martin Luther smiling and John Calvin and, and uh, John Wesley and Alexander Campbell. All the great Protestant reformers, all the back to Bible people love that image that we have. That's really, that's us. Uh, when I said in matters of faith unity, there are not many matters of faith. In matters of opinion liberty, there's hundreds of those, maybe thousands. But we give each other liberty. We are a church of mavericks. There's nothing higher in the church of Christ than the local church. Nothing higher. Autonomy everywhere. People here think, boy, if we could just cut the root from the churches. No, that, you're wrong. Churches of Christ have no power. The idea that a group of people could get together in Dallas, Texas, or Nashville, Tennessee, and draw up a list of 14 things that Pepperdine better start doing right away, that wouldn't happen. And uh, it's, it's, we are a, a fellowship of mavericks who uh, have al allowed all of this freedom. But this strong view of the Bible, um, an example of a matter of faith would be the divinity of Christ. I mean, that holds us together. But also a strong view of Scripture, that it is the inspired Word of God. And to us it is trustworthy and authoritative. And here's an example of what Bill did. Not in the same year that Bill is welcoming Governor Reagan to give the speech on dedication of Cedar College. And then here comes President Ford, a sitting president, to dedicate Brockhouse and the, and the Firestone Field. In that same year, four days before Reagan comes, I'm on, you know, on the phone with Bill saying, would you come dedicate our little church building in Santa Barbara? And of course he comes. I mean, Bill is very committed to church. I think our date was April 16, and Reagan came April 20. So Bill drives down with Walter and Betty Glass, and he walks in, and the place is packed, and it became obvious to me in a matter of seconds that Bill didn't have anything to say. <laughs> you know? But I watched him. I watched him walk over like Abraham Lincoln, pull out an envelope, write the Gettysburg Address. In this case, the dedication speech of the Turnpike Road Church. And it was fantastic. It was more than fantastic. I mean, it was spellbinding. He had that gift. Um, the biggest part of that attendant, uh, people there that day that surprised me were mostly women from the Republican Party because Bill's name was in the news about maybe being the next governor of California. So all the Republicans in Santa Barbara came out to see who was speaking at our... Uh... Then we go to Howard White, who becomes president 78 to 85. For 12 years, he lived in New Orleans, and he built the great Carrollton Avenue Church Christ, and it says 1947, he was the minister. And... Uh, in that, when he was dying here on campus, and he asked me to give the eulogy at his funeral in the chapel, he said, Jerry, take any book you want. And I took several of his books, but I said, Dr. White, I want this one. The Heart of the Yale Lectures, the PhD dissertation of Bessel Barrett Baxter at USC on the history of the Beecher Lectures, the lectures at Yale, the Heart of the Yale Lectures, uh, this wonderful heart hardback book, and he got it published by Macmillan in 1947. He's remembering his friend from college, Howard White, and he's doing a good job there in New Orleans. And so he writes this note on the book, and I said to Howard, this is, the, of all the books you have, this is the one I want, where he writes, Howard White, congratulations on your excellent achievements as a preacher of the gospel. The future appears very bright. And it was in 1947 for that generation. 
for Frank Pack and Jimmy Smythe and Norval Young and Basil Barrett Baxter and W.B. West and all of these guys that were getting their doctorates in that decade, the future was very bright. Warm personal regards, Basil Barrett Baxter, November 27, 1947. Here are four of the first five presidents. Baxter had died by this time, but president number two, Tyner, three, Young, four, Bonowski, five, White, September 13, 1978. Now it's time for the presidency of David Davenport. Howard White said to me, when do you think I should step down from being president of Pepperdine? I said, you're asking me? I don't know, it's sometime during the summer, isn't it? How do we do anything? I don't know. In the summer? He said, uh, he said well, I was thinking that my last day would be April 15, so that David's first day could be Tuesday, April 16. Uh, and I was still buffaloed by this. I said, well, that, that sounds fine. Uh, Tuesday, April 16 is the, um, is the opening night of the Bible lectures, and the keynote speaker in Firestone Field is David Davenport. Oh, I see what you're doing. You're letting David come into his presidency and preach on the opening night from Hebrews 1, 1 to 4. In former days, God spoke to us through the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. Wow. I said, um, could we just go ahead and have the inauguration? That's how dumb I was. I mean, you're going to see the inauguration this week in two days. You don't do that overnight. And... Uh, so <laughs> Claudia Arnold really took me to task for that. And rightly so. What a dumb idea. She said, we're, we're having the inauguration in September. Go away, little boy. Stop doing it. But then I countered with, what about a spiritual inauguration? I'll write a script. See if you like it. And I took the words of King David. And I said, Howard, this, you read this. And then I took his son, Solomon. And I said, David, you read this. Let's see if this will work. We'll have a spiritual order. I wanted to hear Howard say, Be strong, my son. And I wanted David to say, I will. And they went for it. And now we'll uh, show you uh, that night. And up here at the left, there at the podium, April 16, 1985, we'll show you a two-minute clip. And that we are working not merely for things that we see now, but we're working for eternity and for the souls of human beings. And so at this time, I want to ask David to join me here at the podium. And I would like to give to him from the scriptures, from the book of First Samuel, First Chronicles rather, chapter 22, the charge that David the king gave to his son Solomon as he looked toward the time that Solomon would take on heavy responsibilities. My son, may the Lord be with you. May the Lord grant you discretion and understanding. May you keep the law of the Lord your God. Then you will prosper if you are careful to obey the commands of the Lord. Be strong and of good courage. Fear not, be not dismayed. Arise and be doing. The Lord be with you. Dr. White, I've chosen these words from Psalm 25 with which to respond to your charge. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Show me your paths, O Lord. Teach me your ways. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are my God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. May integrity and uprightness protect me, because my hope is in you. Well, that's beautiful to say that again. That was a long time ago. Now, what was happening in the, um, I'll get back to the slide itself. Over here, 15 years later, David speaks on opening night, his first day in office. 
and he's fixed on closing night 15 years later. I asked him to do the closing night of Romans. That wasn't his last day. Andy started June 16. David had about six weeks to go to clean up some things. But uh, it was close to the end. And we gave him a beautiful plaque. And I'll show it to you in a, morning, in a moment. He's looking at it, and Andy is reading some. And that's May 5, 2000. So David becomes president, Charlie Runnels is his chancellor, and the outgoing president and his chancellor, Howard White and Norval Young, April 16, 1985. I use David a lot for public speaking. I'll say right now, and nobody will contradict it, of the eight presidents, the two best preachers of the gospel were Bill Bonowski and David Davenport. They could speak to very large crowds. And to have a picture of David with his Bible it is under one arm and, and his hand out, this is Thursday night, April 20, 1989. He's preaching before 4,000 plus people in Firestone Fieldhouse. Our book that year is Exodus, and the theme is Deliverance, great themes from Exodus. And um, that, that sort of summarizes the 15 years for me with David. He was, every, he was so involved in the lectures, they were getting bigger all the time. And, uh, and he, he would give me constructive criticism. Why don't we try this? Why don't we do this? Um, but never, never disagreed with me so much that I got discouraged. In between us, we kept building it, and it got bigger. And this is what we gave him. And now, I called Bill Henniger. I can't remember where we took this, which calligrapher. Uh, maybe some of you could tell me afterward. But anyway, the mission of Pepperdine University. Pepperdine <coughs> is a Christian university committed to the highest standards of academic excellence and Christian values, where students are strengthened for lives of purpose, service, and leadership. And we wrote, presented to President David Davenport at the 57th Annual Lectures, May 5, on the occasion of the 15th anniversary of your spiritual inauguration, April 16, 1985, a grateful university gives back to you a copy of what you gave to it, the mission of a Christian university. He called the committee together and said, we need a tight statement for our mission. And they got it down to 27 words. And the only word used twice was Christian. <laughs> what a statement. And so this beautiful calligraphy. Um, now we come to Andy. And uh, he asked Richard Hughes to write give that great speech um, 19 years ago on the idea of a Christian university. And at the end, he quoted this. He's talking about the need for academic scholarship. And he builds the case. And the need for diversity and he builds the case. And the third and last need is to stay close to our roots, our heritage. And he summarizes that with, and finally, he's asking the question, what does it mean to be a Christian university? And finally it means that Pepperdine seeks to strengthen its relationship with churches of Christ, not only because we know that apart from that relationship, the Christian character of this institution would likely collapse, but also because we know that the Churches of Christ can provide us with invaluable supports for the work in which we are engaged. And tw uh, 19 years ago today, um, September 23, at the inauguration of Andy Benton, 19 years ago today, Andy, under his uh, section in his speech, Connection to Our Heritage, wrote, since the university is not controlled by a church, has no organic link with any external organization, Pepperdine remains connected with its heritage through individual members of the Churches of Christ. And the next year, he um, put out the vision statement, 2001, envisioning a bold future. And Andy writes, a discussion of the university's heritage begins with George Pepperdine's founding vision. What is that? That of a school rooted in its relationship with the Churches of Christ. That relationship provides anchor, and it provides stability, and it shapes us. It gives form to our mission. Anchor, stability, form. I told him I thought it was, it was the best line he had ever crafted. Uh, during his presidency, he presided every year over the Bible lectures. Now, we surprised him up this year. He's always up there presiding. But that year, Tom Albright walked up with this book and said, um, David, you know, we're doing First John this year, and I've written the book that's going to guide us through the week, and I've dedicated it to you. 
This book is dedicated to Andrew K. Benton, the seventh president of Pepperdine University and presented at the 63rd Annual Bible Lectures, May 2, 2006. President Benton has made a serious commitment to these lectures. He sure has, both in respect to the resources of the university and in respect to his own personal time. He came to me right after he became president and said, are you tired? And I said, yeah. He said, you've been doing it for quite a while? I said, yeah. Are you thinking maybe a good time to, yeah, <laughs> let somebody else do it? And he said, I'm, I'm going to breathe life into you. I'm, I'm going to bring you back. That was in 2000. He called me in 2007 and said, well, I've held on to you for seven more years, but this is, the lectures are coming up. This was our meeting of April 9th. Bible lectures are coming up, it's your 25th. I said, yeah, it's, I'm, I've broken the record. Carl McKean did 24 at Abilene. So Carl has offered to fly out with some kind of joke gift, you know, a prickly pear or something. <laughs> Give it to me and say, this is now yours. You've done 25, you've broken my record. You get to keep this cactus from Texas or something like that. <laughs> we didn't do that. I said, I don't think anybody would find that funny but you and me, Carl. Let's not do it. <laughs> but uh, it was my 25th year, and I thought, this is a good time to walk away. And on that day, that really changed my life. He said, what would it take for you to do five more? And when I came to, he was pouring water over my face <laughs> from that little uh, potted plant that he had there, and bringing me back. I said, you want me to do 2008, 9, 10, 11, and 12? Oh my, I would be 69 and a half. You, you don't have enough arrows in your quiver, I said to him. <laughs> but uh, he talked me into it. And those were the best five years I ever did. I mean, it got bigger each year. If I had to be judged by anything, I'd be judged on the last five years. That's when we really became global. And we ended up with 35 nations teaching that last year. So he pulled that out of me. So he belongs here. Uh, presiding, but this year we fooled him and dedicated the book. And this is not a great photo, a little blurry, but every his, his connection to AWP and the way they would bring him the check for scholarships for Churches of Christ students, and he's applauding and thanking them. And then we come to Jim Gash, who's been in now for a month or so. And Jim's great book, which I've been reading again this week about Henry and how he changed his life, saved his life, got him out of prison. Uh, tonight is the big worship ceremony. Bob Goff, I'm sorry, Bob Goff is one of our uh, speakers tonight. And um, so I start with this, but I really loved this. When we did the uh, tour of the presidential offices and I walked in, something was different, but I couldn't figure it out. All the, on the right hand side here was all the, uh, supposed to be filing cabinets. We had all those filing cabinets there. And I walk off over sort of this way to look, and the filing cabinets were gone, and here's what was in their place. An enormous Pepperdine. And this quotation, the work which will be done through the days and years and generations to come will be of very great importance if that work is guided by the hand of God. Now, when did George Pepperdine say that? September 21, 1937. But when did he say it for the last time when they wheeled out this gurney on March 26, 1962, 24 and a half years later, the people I've interviewed said, he was talking that night about the hand of God. That doesn't surprise me. Jim now has started his presidency after his strong commitment to strengthening the ties with Church of Christ, to putting on the entrance to his office in the presidential suite this quote that goes back to our beginning. If that isn't a powerful statement, I was visibly moved by that. I, for a moment, I just couldn't move at how beautiful it was. And um, then I said to Ron Hall, did you get a picture of that? Well, no, Ron didn't get a picture of that. Why? He said, there were too many people in the way, and everybody was eating, and oh, God. I called Cindy Favell. Are there any photos? I, get, I need to finish my PowerPoint. She said, well, um, I'll go out and take a picture right now. And then she writes me and says, it got damaged and we've sent it out to be repaired. I don't know what part was damaged. Uh, then she writes back and says, two weeks ago I took a picture, but you know, it's not very good. But it's, she sent it to me, not very good, this is perfect. Wow, it fits perfectly between the two images. So the mission statement we've already read, 
The vision statement, Pepperdine University would be a preeminent global Christian university known for the integration of faith and learning whose graduates lead purposeful lives as servant-minded leaders throughout the world. And then if you go online, the definition of that vision, our vision statement declares what we intend to become. George Pepperdine envisioned an institution that would transform students' lives so that they would, in turn, impact culture. He imagined, imagined a vast body of alumni, men and women, conscious of their good fortune, recipients of the generous gifts of a Christian education, who would feel the moral imperative to serve others sacrificially. Hence the school's motto, the words of Jesus, freely you receive, freely give. And the affirmed statement that God is, he's revealed uniquely in Christ, that knowledge calls ultimately for a life of service. I close with George Pepperdine. When you read the autobiographical of George Pepperdine, it's got that section in the back, in all caps, I am thinking, I am thinking. And, and then what I believe, what I believe. It's the last 30 or 40 pages. If you're ever going to pick up the autobiography, just go to that. That's, that's the heart there. And the one that always touches me is this one. I am thinking with deep regret that I've had only one life to give for the cause of Christ and only one fortune to give for the promotion of Christian education. If I had many more of each, I would gladly give them all for such causes. Well, it was only one life and only uh, one fortune, but it sure touched all of our lives. And um, I was looking through our, what, our collection, and I saw this yearbook from Lipscomb. And this is 1933. John Wilson donated this. It's in our Heritage Center. And it's Batsel Barrett. Bar our first president writes in it, and it's a gift to his son, Batsel Barrett. And he says, here's this yearbook. And I start through, Batsel Barrett is the president, four years before he becomes president of Pepperdine. Then I look at the students, there's M. Norval Young, he's going to be president at number three. And, um, and then with him there is Batsel Barrett Baxter. And, um, and I'm looking through, and then I see the, um, the student paper. The editor is a kid named Howard White, and he's editing the Babbler. <laughs> B-A-B-B-L-E-R, the babbler in, uh, in 1933. And um, have you seen the picture around campus that has the, um, um, the picture of the first four graduates in 1938? The three young men and the one girl. Mm -hmm. And the girl is Carmen Landrum. And she's from Lipscomb, and she's in here, and she's from Tompkinsville, Kentucky. And she's working with Howard White on the school paper, and she's the joke editor. I didn't even know you had a joke editor. <laughs> I don't know if we have one in the graphic, uh, but here she is, and then she comes to Pepperdine, and she's in that group of the first four graduates. And then I go over to the speech contest, and the winner of the great oratorical contest is a kid named Frank Pack from Memphis, Tennessee. And, uh, but not be far below him down here is Howard White. He came in close. He was challenging him. All of these names, these are our names. And you begin to understand why, when we built this campus, the students in the graphic, looking at the President Delbanowski, Lipscomb, the Chancellor, Norval Young, Lipscomb, Frank Pack, Lipscomb, Jerry Hudson, Lipscomb, the basketball coach, Lipscomb, the athletic director, going through all of this, they referred to this beautiful campus as Lipscomb by the Sea. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't necessarily negative. Yeah, they were kidding and playing with it. But the relationship between each of the Christian schools, George Pepperdine goes back to Harding at Thanksgiving because Benson begs him to come. And he says, we had an $80,000 debt. I've devoted two years now, three years. We've gone to every donor 10 times. We have no place else to go. We still owe $25,000. We're going to have to close. And George and Helen go out, and they spend the whole Thanksgiving holiday. And at the end, George writes a check, handwritten fountain pen, $25,000, pretty close to $600,000 today. Vincent told me that when he went to the First National Bank in Searcy with that check, the president of the bank said, I have never seen a handwritten check for such an amount. I've never seen that big a check, and I'm the president of the bank. 25000 George Pepperdine needed every penny to keep his school going. But he gives the equivalent of $600,000 because, as Norval reminded us over and over and over again, there is no competition between 
lighthouses. We, on the stormy sea of secularism, and our Christian schools are trying to survive, we need every school we can get. And there's no competition between lighthouses.